Episode 38, A Stiff-Necked People. It couldn't have been more than six weeks later after the awe-inspiring interaction between God and the Israelites. Yet they are making themselves an image of a calf to lead them to the promised land. Welcome to the History of the Bible. When Moses first went up the hill to receive the instructions from God on how to hold up their end of the covenant by building the tabernacle, the people of Israel start to get restless about their leader that led them out of Egypt, and from their perspective, they were wanting someone or something to go before them on their journey. So all the people came up to Aaron, the man that would be their high priest, serving the one true God later on, and told him to make gods for the people to follow on their journey ahead of them. Now, remember, this was less than 40 days since God spoke to the whole nation of Israel and showed his power with thunder, lightning, earthquakes, and fires at the base of Mount Sinai. Pretty quick to forget the covenant that was just agreed upon. Not to mention, they did hear God himself say to have no other gods, but the people's hearts turned back to Egypt and its gods. So Aaron told the people to gather up all the gold earrings and to bring them to him. He would then make the earrings into a golden calf. The cow in Egypt was a symbol of provision and prosperity. However, some believe that the golden calf was not meant to take the place of God, but to be a symbol or a visual image of God. But God also told the people to not make an image for him. Another thought is that the calf was made to become a mediator between God and the people, taking the place of Moses because apparently no one knew where he was. But we know that the people intended to create their God because Exodus 32 verse 4 says, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Other translations believe it to say, Here is your God, O Israel. It would be translated to be a single God, not plural. What isn't fully clear is whether the Israelites intended to replace God with other Egyptian gods, have another God alongside the true God, or just create an image for them to worship that represented the one true God. In other ancient cultures, there are depictions of gods and goddesses standing on top of a cow. In these images from other surrounding countries, the cow is a pedestal or a footstool for the deity. Some scholars believe that the calf made by the Israelites could be a pedestal or a footstool for the invisible God. Now, Aaron created the image which can be hard to understand because he was next to Moses all along the way in the Israelites gaining their freedom. So what made Aaron want to make a golden calf that would be worshipped? In Exodus 32 verse 1, it says that the people of Israel, that the whole nation, gathered themselves before Aaron and told him to make an image. This was open rebellion against God. And it wasn't just a couple of people that were gathering together. It was the whole nation. Though Aaron may have made the image, it could be that he was placed in a hard situation. You see, some scholars believe that it was both Aaron and her that were left in charge to lead the people. And that when the rebellion happened, that her spoke out against the people for their turning away from God. This is believed to have caused the people to kill her. This left Aaron with the choice of either bending to the demands of the people or dying. Although Aaron wouldn't own up to making the calf later on, even though he used a graving tool to make the calf, it does seem that even while the Israelites worshipped, he was still trying to point them to the true God. Because in verse 5 of chapter 32, Aaron calls for a feast to the Lord. Although as Aaron was saying this, he built an altar to the calf. Yes, it does seem a little controversial. But the day after the calf and the altar were built, Israel had a feast. Later on in chapter 32, verse 6, says that the people rose early in the morning 
and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, the same ones that the Lord told the Israelites to offer to him. It also says that the people rose to eat, drink, and play. Now the word play can mean a couple of different things. It could be related to laughter, just like when Abraham and Sarah laughed when God said that they were going to have a child in their old age. It could be related to sports or performing them. But it is also the same word used in Genesis 26, verse 8, when the king knew that Isaac and Rebekah were married because they were playing with each other. Some translations say caressing instead of playing. This causes some scholars to believe that it was just a giant party with plenty of laughter, while others believe it to be dancing and orgies. It all depends on how the calf is viewed. If it is viewed as the Israelites creating a new god for themselves to replicate what Egypt was doing, then yes, it could then be a party of dancing. But if we look at it as the Israelites felt they lost their mediator between God and themselves when Moses didn't come down, and the words are translated to mean a single God when they said, Here is your God, O Israel. Aaron dedicates the feast to the Lord. And the Israelites build an altar and offer the same sacrifices that the Lord required. Then it could be that the calf was created to be an image of the Lord. However, that doesn't mean the Israelites were just mistaken in their worship. They were still in open rebellion against God because they created an image that was supposed to represent the God who brought them out of Egypt. And they worshipped it rather than the Lord. This rebellion would not go unchecked though, because while this is happening, the Lord tells Moses of it on the mountain. Moses would have an interesting conversation with God. When God tells Moses about the sin which the Israelites are committing, God tells him to go down to Moses' people, whom Moses brought out of Egypt, and that they can restart everything with Moses and make a nation. But Moses steps into the role of a mediator for the people. Moses points out that these people are gods and that God brought them out of Egypt with great signs and wonders. And that if God did destroy the whole nation, the Egyptians would come to believe that the Israelites' God just saved them to kill them in the wilderness. Moses then would go on to tell God the promises that were given to him by God himself. The promises that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all received from God. Now, it may sound a little harsh to say that God wanted to destroy the whole nation of Israel and restart with Moses, but if we look at this from the perspective of marriage, then it would make a little more sense. God, being the groom, is watching his bride, the Israelites, pursuing other gods very shortly after getting married or making the covenant. Moses went back down the mountain. This time, he had the two stone tablets that God had written on it with his own hands. If we remember, Joshua went up the mountain with Moses too. Therefore, he was unaware of the situation and thought that the people were shouting either in victory or in defeat of a battle. But Moses knew that it wasn't either one, but that of dancing and celebration. When Moses saw the people and the golden calf, he threw the stones with the covenant down. When they landed, the tablets broke, symbolizing the Israelites just broke the covenant with God. Moses would then have the calf melted down, and then once it was cooled off, they would then grind the gold into dust and spread it on a stream nearby and had the people drink of the water. As Moses did this, he would call Aaron out from making the calf for the people. But Aaron would not take responsibility, but denied that it was his fault. When questioned how he could have done it, he simply said, he threw the gold into the fire and just like that, out came a calf. So Moses would stand at the gate of the camp, or the entrance to the camp, and call out for anyone that was with him to stand next to him. All of the sons of Levi joined Moses at the gate. Moses then told those that had joined him to get their sword and to walk back and forth through the camp and kill. Who to kill, though, isn't clear. 
It says in Exodus 32 verse 27 that Moses tells him to kill his brother, companion, and neighbor. It is believed that those that the Levites killed were people that were still celebrating and worshiping the false god after Moses had come down to put an end to things, but sometimes word travels slow, especially if the celebrating and feasting were happening with individual families rather than a large group or community of people. Others say that those who got killed by the Levites were the ones that started the rebellion. Because the Levites were the ones in the camp when it all started, they would know the ones who initiated the rebellion. Other scholars believe that when the Levites put on their swords and gathered with Moses, a battle raged between the Levites and the rebellion. A battle raged between the Levites and the rebels. The results were deaths on both sides, yet the Levites won. When the Levites walked through the camp, about 3,000 men were killed, who were either those that worshipped the calf, the leaders of the rebellion, or after the battle, a total of 3,000 men died on both sides. And when they had finished, Moses says that because of what they have done, the clan of the Levites was ordained to serve the Lord. Up until this point, it was Aaron and his sons who were the only ones that were called to become a priest to the Lord. But now the whole clan of Levi was to serve the Lord so that they would be a blessing to the future generation. Because of their fierceness for the Lord, their curse was now made a blessing. Remember in Genesis 49 verse 7, when Jacob cursed Levi because he and his brother wiped out everyone in the city after the ruler's son raped their sister? Well, after Levi did that, Jacob cursed him for his fierceness so that he wouldn't have an inheritance in the promised land. Coming back to the present, that same fierceness was in Levi's descendants, but this time it was used for good. When Moses called for those who were for God to stand with him at the gate, the tribe of Levi was the only one to do so. Because of this, they would then be ordained to serve the Lord throughout the whole nation. God took a curse and used it for a blessing, taking what was bad and using it for good. The next day, after the death of 3,000 men, Moses went back up to the mountaintop where he would talk to the Lord, confessing the sin of the nation to God and asking him to forgive his people. Moses asked God to forgive them, but that if he wouldn't, he would rather die than go a day without the Lord. However, the Lord said that whoever has sinned against him with the calf, he will be judged. This would be done later, as the Lord would send a plague on the people. Moses was now to lead the people away from the mountain and into the promised land. But instead of the Lord leading them, he said that he would send an angel to lead them. Again, Moses would step into the position of being a mediator for the people before God. The Lord was going to send Moses and the Israelites to the promised land with an angel leading them. In Exodus 33 verse 3, God sent them off, but he would not go with them because the people were a stiff-necked people. The term stiff-necked is one from an agricultural background. When a farmer needed to plow his field, he would get two oxen together, usually an older one and a younger one. Often, when an ox was not willing to be controlled and directed in the right direction, they would refer to the ox as being stiff-necked. This is what the Israelites were doing. They were unwilling to be led by God, becoming a stubborn nation. Again, Moses would intercede for the people between God and them. This is one in which Moses would represent Christ in the future because Jesus is before the Father interceding for us. Moses had an incredible relationship with God. Up until this point, no one has had such constant communication with God face to face as a person would speak to a friend. As Exodus 33 verse 11 says, Whenever Moses walked into the tent of meeting, the pillar of cloud would fall in the tent, and here is where they would talk with one another. The tent that was set up as the tent of meeting 
was a temporary place used before the tabernacle was constructed. After the tabernacle was constructed, this would be used as a place to meet with God, and it too would be referred to as a tent of meeting. This temporary tent was set up outside the camp because of the broken covenant that was between God and Israel. It wasn't that God didn't want to be with his people. In reality, God was deeply desiring to have a relationship with his people. But because the covenant was broken, what stood between Israel and God was sin. It was here in the tent of meeting that Moses and God were talking about going into the promised land. God was wanting to send the people to the land with an angel guiding them. Moses, on the other hand, was not willing to settle for an angel. Now, most people would be glad to just get an angel to lead them, but Moses wanted more. This is where the relationship between the two shows. Moses wanted to be shown not only the will of God, but also the glory of God. In Exodus 33, verse 16, Moses knew the importance of being with the Father and staying within the presence of God. He also knew that it was God being with them that made them different than the surrounding nations. Because of the favor that Moses had with God, God was willing to stay with the people of Israel for the sake of Moses, as well as fulfill the request by Moses to see this glory. The Hebrew word for glory that Moses requested to see is kavod. This word is related to the weight and heaviness of God's presence. More on this in another episode. But God knows that a human being cannot see the fullness of God's glory and still live. God tells Moses that he would let him see his goodness pass. Except Moses would not be able to see God face to face when he is in his full glory. To remedy this, God is going to have Moses in a cleft of a rock and be covered by God's hand. And after the Lord passes by, he will remove his hand and allow for Moses to see his back, but not his face. When Moses came up to the mountain with new tablets for the Lord to write on, the Lord passed before Moses, declaring his name to Moses as he passed. When God was declaring his name to Moses, God was giving him a view into who he was. After this covenant was renewed between God and the people of Israel, this is where God agrees once again to be among his people. After meeting with God, Moses comes down from the mountain, and it says in Exodus 34 verse 29 that his face was shining because he spoke to God. Now, some believe the Hebrew word that is used for shine when the Bible talks about Moses' face could be referring to mean horns. Some scholars say that depending on the translation of Greek or Hebrew, that the Greek word is the same as horns, where the Hebrew word haran, which means shine, could be related to karen, which means horn. Yes, some scholars believe that rather than Moses' face shining, he had horns appear. And no, these aren't horns like you would picture today on Satan, but horns like a cow. In ancient times, the cow was seen as the ultimate divine provider. This in turn would make the cow's horns a symbol of that divine provision. However, as other writings were discovered from Mesopotamia, it could mean both horns and shine. The reason for this discovery is because the same word would say that the sun shine horns of light. In the same way that today we would say a beam of light, it isn't a beam, nor is it an actual horn, but it protrudes from the source of light like a horn would on an animal. Because of Moses and his face shining, the people feared being around him. So Moses would wear a veil over his face for the sake of the people. When Moses came down from the mountain with a radiant face, he also carried a new set of stone tablets that he carved out and that God wrote, once again, the terms of the covenant. Once the covenant was reenacted between God and the Israelites, the tabernacle would finally be made, and here the presence of God would dwell with the Israelites.
With the covenant renewed between God and the Israelites, it was time to build the physical representation of God dwelling with his people. Moses would follow every detail that God gave him regarding the tabernacle. He would accept all of the contributions and offerings of metals of gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, scarlet yarns, and fine twisted linen, goat's hair, ramskin, and goatskin, acacia wood, oil, spices, and precious stones. All these things Moses requested the people of Israel to give as an offering to the Lord freely out of their generosity. So everyone's heart that was stirred gave to the offering so that the tabernacle and all that was needed for it was able to be built and made. It ended up being so many offerings that came in that the craftsmen came to Moses and told him that they had plenty of materials. So Moses had to restrain the people from giving any more. The materials that were used to make the tabernacle were 29 talents and 730 shekels of gold. 100 talents and 1,775 shekels of silver, 70 talents and 2,400 shekels of bronze. A shekel was considered to be about 0.4 ounces or 11.3 grams, and a talent was 75 pounds. This would be just about 2,200 pounds of gold, 7,500 pounds of silver, and 5,300 pounds of bronze. Today, that would be about $3.8 million in gold, $150,000 in silver, and $13,000 in bronze, almost $4 million in today's value. The construction of the tabernacle was overseen by two men, Bizalal and Oholiab, as they had the Spirit of God inside of them giving them ability to craft the tabernacle. Often in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God doesn't dwell inside of someone, only rests on them. For the most part, the Holy Spirit would come to dwell inside of people in the New Testament on the day of Pentecost. Not much is known about these two men, only that Bizalel was the grandson of Hur, Many believe it to be the same her that helped Aaron hold up Moses' arm during their battle with the Amalekites, a descendant of Judah. He was a craftsman. And for Oholiab, he was the son of Ahizma from the tribe of Dan who worked with engraving, designing, and embroidering scarlet yarns and linen. These two men were in charge of making every piece of furniture, curtain, garment, or anything that had to do with the tabernacle, as they gathered other craftsmen and designers around them to help them with the job. This team of craftsmen would go to work making all the items for the tabernacle, including the tent itself, the Ark or the Ark of the Covenant, the Table of the Presence, the Lampstand, the Altar of Incense, the Altar of Burnt Offerings, the Priest's Garment, and all of the utensils for the tabernacle were crafted. Once the materials were finished, it was finally time to build the tabernacle, the place of God's physical presence would be. When the tabernacle was to be set up, the Lord told Moses to go around that whole place and anoint it with oil, making it holy and set apart for the worship of God. It is believed that from the time the Israelites arrived at Mount Sinai, to the moment the tabernacle was erected on that first day of the first month of the second year, as Exodus 40 says, was about nine months. With the time that was spent by Moses on the mountain, the items built for the tabernacle could have taken about six months to do. When the tabernacle was finished, Moses took the stone tablets that had the covenant written upon them and placed them inside of the ark. That is why sometimes it is referred to as the Ark of the Covenant. It was at this time that the presence of the Lord fell on the tabernacle. So heavy was the glory of God on the place that not even Moses was able to enter. So it was that whenever the cloud by day and fire by night rested on the tabernacle, the Israelites would stay where they were camped. But when the cloud or fire lifted, 
Then the Israelites would pack up all their belongings and begin to make the journey. And so it was this way the whole time until the Israelites came into the promised land. This episode concludes the last chapters of Exodus. So join us next time in episode 39, the book of Leviticus. Until next time, remember that you are loved, special, and worthwhile.